Thank you all for being here today. I'm Allison Fumeo, partner in Deckard's Financial Services Group, and I'm happy to introduce our panel on closed-end funds addressing the primary and secondary market challenges. Uh, very quickly, we have Bob Bush uh, from Calamos. We have Mike, Michael Osi from Morgan Stanley, Steve Bafico from Forwood Capital Partners, Gaston Jordan from Naveen, and Jerry Rayo from Wells Fargo. On that note, we're going to get right into it. We have a lot that's going to come today in only about 40 minutes. We do plan to leave five minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, so if you can keep your questions till then, that would be great. Let's just set the stage before we get into what everybody wants to hear about and talk a little bit about the structural changes that have occurred in the closed-end fund market and what's led to them, which I think will then bring us into the more meaty discussion of what are the challenges and where are we going. This is Jerry Ray. Good afternoon, everyone. Maybe I'll, I'll start. I work at uh, Wells Fargo in equity capital markets. Uh, so I think it, it's important to look at the backdrop of kind of where we've come from in the closed end fund IPO market, looking back to right after the financial crisis. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. So if we look back, like right after the financial crisis, the, the, the market was revived, the IPO market. If you look at 2010 to 2000 and 14, we had a pretty robust market. Um, we didn't really see a lot of structural changes at that point until we got to about 2014. As a result, of we had rising interest rates, uh, the closed-end fund secondary market had sold off, and the closed-end fund IPO market had slowed down. So I think we started to look at, again, we think this is um, probably the best vehicle for bringing investment solutions to retail clients. And I think if you talk to portfolio managers, it's the best investment vehicle for them to manage, uh, to, to manage strategies. So the IPO, we think the IPO market is, is very important, so, and it plays off of the, the secondary market. But we saw that the secondary market had sold off and we needed to make some structural changes uh, to the, the, the closed-end fund vehicle in order to be able to bring out these strategies. So we saw the evolution of some changes the target term structure, and uh, one of the panelists here, Gaston Yardin from Nuveen, can talk more about this. They were really the architect of it, but was really to, um, to, to what, what I would say they had four characteristics that addressed some of the issues and challenges that we faced within the closed-end fund market. One was we saw that we shortened terms or put terms in place, whereby before the closed-end funds were perpetual, and as a result, they perpetually traded at discounts, um, we put in place some type of a term where at the end of the term, the fund would either open end or would terminate. Um, and that term got truncated from, we had seen 15 year terms that you know, had little impact in the beginning when you first IPO'd it, down to you know, three, five, and seven year terms. So that helped a lot uh, in, in, in the secondary market. Secondly is a lower upfront cost structure. It was remarkable that the closed end fund market had really been immune to some of the pressures that have gone on throughout the industry. And it was about time we started to look at some of the, the cost structure. So the, the structures went down to as low as you know, one and a half percent coming out of the fund, and in some cases, 3%. So we, we've changed the, that structure so that the market price and the NAV are more closely aligned. Thirdly was that the, the funds had a dual investment uh, objective of current income, but also to return back the IPO NAV. And that was very different because it kind of held the, uh, the portfolio manager's feet to the fire to deliver a particular yield, but also being cognizant that they have to try to return back the, uh, the IPO NAV. So they couldn't take undue, undue duration risk, the, the uh, the risk of potentially not being able to meet that second objective. And then the last one wasn't as consistent, but putting a collar around the uh, maturity of the underlying securities such that they couldn't be greater <clears throat> than six months past the, the, the term of the fund. So essentially limiting the overall duration of the fund. And that helped in the market. I think where we've come now, and those were mostly uh, fixed income focused funds focused on the high yield market. What we're seeing now, and I guess we're kind of looking for that next evolution in the market here, and a lot of people have been asking, you know, what's going to open the market? And I wish that we had that answer today to say we have the answer. We think we have some, some changes that are being made in the evolution to lead to uh, what will be a more robust IPO market. But I think what you're going to see in the IPO market is an evolution to still having terms, still having a lower cost structure, but having some more 
innovative alternative strategies. Again, that can deliver a, a certain solution to clients. Um, so that's where I think we're going, and I think we have some good ideas that are, uh, that are out there and we'll be bringing to market in the not too distant future, and we're hopeful that that will uh, hopefully open the IPO market. Thank you. Um, Gaston, do you want to say a little bit more about the term structure and why we, as Jerry said, will continue to see that for at least the near term? Sure. I think, uh, in general, Jerry, you hit on all the great points about what makes the target term so successful. Yes, Nuveen uh, architected these funds, but ultimately it was partnership with, with you and with Michael to get these funds off the ground because we all saw industry-wise that the closed ends were trading at discounts and ultimately it was a bad investor experience once the, the penalty bid got lifted from, from the funds. So I think what's nice about these target terms as well as all the features that are baked into them, they, are, they do function like a bond of bonds. They, you know, they have that declining maturity profile. So if it's a five-year target term, for instance, and it starts with, say, four-year duration, that duration will grind to zero, essentially, as you get closer and closer to the termination date. And thus far, knock on wood, all the target term funds have been trading not only at premiums for the majority of their life, but at prices north of their IPO price. So oftentimes, when you had, for instance, a $20 IPO, and when you took, took, took off the 4.5% load, that first, you know, month or two after the IPO process, you would have an $18 and something uh, share price. So one thing that's really nice about the target terms is they do trade well in the secondary. They are delivering good, healthy monthly cash flow. And you know, thus far, they look uh, po well poised to uh, deliver that par back or that ori what we call the original NAV. Yeah, and, and the only thing I add, I think Jerry and Gaston covered it well. I think I believe Nuveen's first deal back in uh, no, November of 15 is just about to mature uh, this year, and the experience, um, I think Gaston was being modest, has been good. I mean, it's trading at a very modest discount to, uh, to NAV uh, at this point in time. I, I think the only one thing I'd add is just to put the issuance in context. For the years of 16 and 17, there were roughly a billion and a half a billion dollars of closed end fund issuance uh, that pales in comparison to what was done, as Jerry alluded to, back in 2012, 2013, when it was really a 10-ish billion dollar market. But it was still functioning at, and alive. We haven't really seen anything in the last six months. I think we at Morgan Stanley, like at Wells, continue to be very bullish um, on the wrapper. We think it there is a lot of value, not only for issuers, but for investors, in that it, it allows for active management, it allows for leverage, uh, and it is a fixed income substitute for, uh, for yield focused in investors. I think what we're really focused on right now is finding the right asset class that, as Jerry outlined, probably fits within this term wrapper, likely for the time being. And potentially over time, there might grow the tolerance for something much longer, if not perpetual, uh, may resurface. We're, we're not there yet, at least representing uh, the kind of FA. Uh, interest level internally, but I think we are looking for something different. The fact of the matter is, over this last six months where we've seen a dearth of issuance, the credit market had rallied over a series of years. And so the, 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 the predominant asset that was put into these vehicles, as Gaston and Jerry alluded to, has been high yield. There's been CLO-focused funds, there's been uh, CRE-focused funds, there's been variants to it, but credit has rallied so much that the outlook for the asset class is admittedly, you know, pretty widespread negative. And so, um, you know, I think it is more challenging to put that into a vehicle, and so we're looking for, for something um, just a, a little bit different, not only in terms of asset class, but in terms of structure. Motivation in this business for innovation has been primarily driven with the deals dealing with discounts. So just to take a step back, this came up on a previous panel. I was really wanted to ask the question, but I didn't want to steal my own thunder, so I didn't. But 
in the 90s, when we were in business and trying to expand upon the closed-end fund space and trying to deal with the discounts, and, and we were partners with Naveen at the time, it was fairly revolutionary, was when we looked at the closed-end fund space and we saw the prolific discounts, those tended to be funds that paid lower dividends, lower distributions. Many of the funds that were done at that point were equity funds. They were country funds, which were big in the 1990s. At that point, we realized that we really wanted to make these more income oriented to alleviate and mitigate the prolific discounts which were in the business right then and there. So at that point in time, the, the business really did transform more from equity and into fixed income and clearly yield oriented product. And that's where we are today. Fast forward to two or three years ago where again we were faced with this conundrum these funds go to discounts particularly after that 60 to 90 day period when the syndicate comes off. What do we do to alleviate that? And I think to the credit of the industry, the gentleman, the lady to my right, um, this term structure has worked very well. These funds have come off out of the box trading at premiums. The costs have been lower. You're getting a different broker selling it because they're paid a little bit less. And we're moving more from, as you well know in our industry, more from a platform that's more, uh, how should I put it, uh, fee-based as opposed to transactional base. This is sold by a transactional broker. But all these things, but in spite of that, the business, the funds have done well. But I think if you, if, if you look forward and you think about now what do we do, what's the next step here, and this, this, also, this topic also came up in, the, in this earlier panel, was how do you make this more of a total return product as opposed to one that's just fixed income oriented. And I think if you look at this term structure where given this finite period of time between when the offering comes out and when the customer will, will get NAV, what the market has done is they've kept that discount pretty tight and in many cases had them trade at premiums because they know that the price is going to be predicated more on what the NAV ultimately is than what the distribution is, what the research community thinks about that particular asset class and so on and so forth. So as we think about terms of how we take this in next step and we look at what the equity market's done, Perhaps thinking in terms of putting these products in equity oriented strategies, which are going to have, in theory, at least in a bull market, more of a run on the NAV, if the stock price follows suit, then you really have made a big change here because it's not focused on completely what the income generation of this is, but really how well the NAV does. Because if the customer is going to get that in a 3, 5, 10, 12 year period, that's going to mitigate the, dis the, the, the discount issue and really make a big step as in evolving this into more of a total return product where it's less incumbent upon distribution and more incumbent upon what the NAV performance is. Thanks, Bob. I, I might take the other side of that, Allison. I mean, I, I think that the, the, it's a much deeper fundamental flaw than we're probably addressing. And, and my view would be that um, the origination and delivery mechanism for these types of products <clears throat> is fundamentally broken. It's fundamentally broken. And what we're trying to do in some ways is keep the market open by pushing square pegs into round holes. Um, Jerry alluded to this earlier. I think that there are really three key um, facts that you have to look at very critically. The regulatory impact, um, the risk appetite or willingness to originate and deliver truly structurally and or commercially innovative products, particularly in this type of wrapper. And I think that the, the impact of fee compression and delivery costs, so the cost of sale has made it infeasible in most cases to deliver um, the traditional asset classes and do it in any kind of meaningful scale. What do I mean by that? Let's take the regulatory element. Jerry, you alluded to this. Um, I don't think you know, that people understand the impact that the fiduciary rule like most government regulation, which is probably pure in its intent, but wildly misguided in its application, has had on an industry like this. These are yield products that are purchased and utilized by decumulation investors. They're drawdown investors. My mom and dad are no different than a pension fund. They have a fixed liability that they're trying to beat. And the majority of those investors have their assets in qualified accounts. And so the fiduciary rule has essentially eliminated, largely, the ability to deliver these type of decumulation products to qualified investors. That's 70% or more of the traditional consumer in this market. So what we've done effectively is eliminated three quarters of our buyer base overnight. Uh, I think the second piece of it is, um, having said that, 
the industry's responsibility, whether you're on the asset manager side or the, you know, or the sell side or the buy side, is to then really figure out and think critically about how you deliver superior product to address uh, a, a new or broader market. Um, and I think that we've done a relatively poor job of that as an industry. Um, you know, I think, Jerry, we, we, we've kind of joked about this story, but, you know, when you do deliver a, a truly kind of innovative asset class, and I agree, the closed-end fund wrapper or, you know, be it a REIT or closed-end fund, any type of yield equity wrapper where you have the ability to manage less liquid, highly specialized assets that deliver superior risk-adjusted returns, that is by far the best, you know, delivery mechanism to do that. But if the participants or the stakeholders are not willing or able to deliver to the market structurally innovative and commercially relevant or innovative product is very difficult to evolve the market. Um, we developed a direct lending strategy a number of years ago. It was, uh, you know, admittedly kind of a first, um, first in breed. It hadn't been proven. Um, and we sat down with um, my, my colleagues. They, they said, this is the most innovative thing we've ever seen. It happened to be a direct lending strategy in shipping um, that we had developed along with other partners. Um, all of the brass said, this is great, we love it, we've never seen anything like this, we can't do this deal. We don't wanna be first in anything. This is one of the biggest banks in the country. We don't wanna be first in anything. So, and again, great partnership, but my point is, um, not that it's a, it's a, it's not, it, it wasn't a, a good partnership, it's simply you have to be willing to take some chances and deliver innovative products um, in wrappers that you think give it the best opportunity to succeed. That's a big risk, you know, when you're sitting in Mike O.C. or Jerry Rayo's seat. Um, and so, you know, it, it's difficult to change organizational thinking. Uh, I think the final point I would make is simply that um, the nature of the product today and the way it's delivered puts an undue burden on the originator or on the manager. So the economics have become very, very difficult um, for a m smaller to mid-sized manager to justify the cost of sale um, and actually make anything to deliver you know, a, 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 a valuable return. So I think our market's broken, um, and I think that what you're gonna see is going forward, the delivery of these investments will completely disintermediate the traditional capital markets. It's happening now. Um, I think what you're going to see is these type of alternative yield products being delivered um, in a slightly different derivative form direct to high net worth investors. And there are both kind of legal and structural innovations that are making that possible today. They will require, you know, good underwriting, good governance, um, and active distribution, but it's going to bypass the capital markets entirely and go directly to the consumers where there's already an embedded demand pull. Harry, Michael, I'm going to throw it out to you um, on how you guys think about what Steve is proposing there, because it sounds like from the beginning of the conversation, there was some hope and optimism around the wrapper that we have and the potential for seeing some good offerings in this in the existing type of wrapper, um, I guess some of the challenges that Steve set forth allow us to think a little bit about, have you guys thought about that in any way, uh, have any comments on that? I'll comment. I, I agree with some of the points that Steve had made. One being the fact that I think the underlying asset classes that we look to put into the closed end fund vehicle have to be warranted for the closed end fund vehicle, right? And looking at niche asset classes that are illiquid, there's a big benefit of going through the closed end fund vehicle. We can take advantage of markets that you just can't do in a daily liquid vehicle. And as a result, we can deliver to the client um, better risk-adjusted returns than potentially other vehicles that are out there today. So I think there's an opportunity as an industry. We have to think a little bit out of the box as to innovative strategies that make sense and can be justified because you, th with the closed-end fund uh, vehicle comes the risk of it can trade at a premium or discount. I look at that as that's a free option, especially now the fact that we have terms on these, right? If you believe in the underlying strategy and you have a 10-year term, and you hold it for that 10-year term, you will get that, that strategy's return in the NAV. The fact that it trades daily gives the, you the option to say, you know what, it's trading at a premium to NAV. I like it at that price. I'm willing to sell it at what I think is overvalued. Or if it's trading at a discount, you hold it and you get that NAV. And I think, um, again, I think we have to move the industry to more innovative strategies, but I think we can open the market 
And again, it's, the IPO is, is a little bit of a tough thing, right, because um, it's hard to find that secondary market buyer. But that's why it's so important that the strategies we bring be innovative because then you'll find secondary market buyers. And that's what we saw in the target term structure. And, and over the years, you know, going back years ago, um, when you have a differentiated strategy that investors can't get in other vehicles, they, they, if they don't participate in the IPO, they gravitate and they buy it in the secondary market, and that's reflected in the trading. And I would just add that you know, one month or six months doesn't make a strategy, right? It, it, can, it, it can trade around the NAV, but time and time again, if you look at the performance, and I think BlackRock actually had um, an analysis up on their website. If you look at the closed-end fund vehicle and the performance by the different strategies, whether that's REITs, high yield, Look across them all. The closed-end fund vehicle outperforms the open-end fund vehicle over all periods, case closed. So I, I think we have an opportunity here in a, a great vehicle, especially to deliver um, some income or, or some distributions, right? As, as Bob had said, we may be doing equity strategies where it's a total return strategy, and what we're doing is we're delivering that expected total return through monthly distributions and through capital appreciation in the NAV. And I guess the argument could be, well, an investor can do that. They can sell a little bit of equity to take the income. But that's just not the way people manage their portfolio. So we have a professional manager that's managing, let's say, an equity portfolio. They're, they're managing it for the best risk-adjusted return. Uh, they're delivering some of that return to you through income, which is what people, people are looking for, not income, go back to monthly distributions, and the rest will accrue to NAV appreciation, which eventually should drive the market price. So that's the point I would make. Yeah, no, I agree with all that, and Steve, I, I think you've made some uh, excellent points. I think our focus internally as it relates to finding what is next and finding a structure that will succeed is focused first and foremost on a different, finding a differentiated asset class. Then the second order question is structurally, what should we do to optimize this vehicle? Whether it's something post IPO, you look at the interval fund world with the, the t tender mechanism, you look at the commercial mortgage reader, you look at the BDC space, they have these post IPO purchase programs, which is really a discount control mechanism. Um, there are things that we can do to adapt this wrapper uh, to be attractive for issuers. Um, and just since I raised the BDC in the, in the commercial mortgage REIT space, right, um, in years past, right, the most of the activity in the IPO market for those vehicles were blind pools, which is kind of the, the standard uh, approach here in the closed end fund market. That market has adapted, and I'm not saying that to suggest that that is where the closed end fund market is going, but the market essentially said, we don't like this anymore. We did four IPOs collectively across those two markets, as, as Art in the back knows, and they were all kind of 600 to a uh, billion dollars in pre-money equity value. So that was a concern of the market. We addressed it, and uh, those businesses have thrived post-IPO. So I think we are optimistic that this market will return, uh, but to Steve's point and, and to Jerry's point, we've got some work to do. I just want to make one, one point. I think what we're seeing in the closed-end fund space, and Steve makes excellent points, by the way, is, is somewhat analogous to what you're seeing in the asset management space. It's the active management versus the passive management. And so what we saw in 2017 and even before that uh, was, okay, why do I want to pay a manager X if I can buy ETF at Y and still get better performance. And the DOL raised that point as well. So I think that very much pertains to the closed end fund space. So it's incumbent upon the space to be proactive and address that. Why is this special? Why is this different? What's this gonna offer the customer that they can't get, not only in the closed end fund space, but anywhere else? It's a very iterative process when you come to market or consider of designing a closed end fund and all the folks on the panel have been involved with that. It isn't just the underwriter comes down and says this is what we're going to do and we like you doing it. There's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of creativity. It's, it's a very interesting dialogue and discussion. We've all been involved with that. So you've got, you've got the minds here. You've got the skills. Um, it's incumbent upon the industry to really focus on what can we deliver that you can't get anywhere else, but more importantly, why can we justify charging more than what a passive, act, passive management structure would charge, and how can the broker, most importantly, rationalize this to their client? Well, you're paying this, 
but you're getting this and this is special and this is why this matters to you and why you should consider it. And I, I would just add one, one more point about, you know, success should breed success, but these, if the industry was relatively broken and perhaps is still broken, I would argue the target terms are just one step forward that we, we've made as an industry to help fix these funds and make them more investor friendly. And at the end of the day, you know, we're talking a big game about these target terms and we're proud of these target terms, but yet not one of them has yet uh, to, to mature or reach its termination date. So we haven't returned to the investor that original NAV just yet. And as Michael alluded to, the first fund that, the first target term that will return original NAV is coming due in, in November of this year. And again, we're, we're well poised to return that original NAV, but I think the proof is in the pudding. And when investors ex actually experience the good monthly cash flow or monthly distributions that they've gotten throughout that three year period, and get their original NAV back or above, they're gonna be pleased and they're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna give this industry, I'm gonna give this closed end fund wrapper another chance because oftentimes you have a portfolio team that manages a closed end fund as well as a mutual fund, for instance, and if you like the team and their strategy and their philosophy and process, why not look at the closed end fund given the benefits of leverage over time, et cetera. No, great, great points, great points. And um, I think one of the things that has come through in this is the fact that we unfortunately do see closed-end funds frequently trading at discounts. But I think what's important to both the sponsors and the underwriters on this panel is, well, what do you do about it? What, what should be done in an ideal world to really support the aftermarket for these closed-end funds? What are those challenges and what have you done that you think help that trading because nobody wants to end looking at these closed end funds right after the IPO. The secondary is almost more important than, than what happens in the IPO. Can we, can we take yeah, that? Please, yeah, sure. Thank you. Look, I think, you know, it's interesting. Morningstar came out with a study, I'm going to say five or six years ago, and they said one of the most important aspects of the closed end fund space in maintaining that price and mitigating that discount is education. Educating the broker as to what they sold, educating the customers to what they own. And so I think it's imperative in, when you're in this space, you want to enter into the space, is to, be, to, to deal with people that are professionals, not only in the front end of distributing it and managing it, because it's a very different product than an open end. It's very different. But also defending it in the secondary and making sure it's sold properly. So to, to your point, it's, you know, from Calamos's perspective, it's being involved in the business, attending these, these discussions, speaking with folks like you that are customers, clients, users, educating them to, to what goes on with it, uh, having an office, uh, making sure you're there to support it in the secondary, uh, having a phone that uh, a research analyst can call, a broker can call, anybody can call with respect to a question about a distribution or the, or what, do you, what uh, uh, you know, the components of any type of distribution were. Anything there to show support in the after market because these are not these are thinly traded securities there's not a lot of liquidity in them I mean they are publicly traded but they don't have they don't have uh, big floats on them so these things really matter is supporting this in the aftermarket by standing by your suite of products and defending them and educating the public uh, and your customers that own them thanks Bob any additional yeah no, no it, I, I agree with Bob I, I think first and foremost it's it's education and it's kind of just boots on the ground uh, IR with admittedly a very different shareholder base than exists in the corporate world. Buybacks and tenders, they do have a technical benefit, but I think we're, we're kind of mixed on the topic. I think they demonstrate a visible signal to support a stock against a pretty illiquid uh, trading profile, but the fact of the matter is you just pulled off uh, what is a pretty exciting IPO of $150 million in this market and you're going to go and destroy it, at least temporarily by, uh, by buying back stock. So you know, I think first and foremost, it's, it's what uh, Bob outlined. I think the other thing not to be discounted is the kind of virtuous circle of liquidity um, and demand to be created around um, not only the active um, management of the um, kind of core constituent relationship, so managing the gate essentially with the financial advisor, but I think increasingly uh, the value of institutional investors or what I would describe as simply a professional buyer. That could be a fund manager that has a yield-oriented um, uh, mandate. 
It could be you know, a financial advisor who really manages a portfolio with discretion. Those, in our experience, have really been the best counterparties as a fund strategy seasons and demonstrates that it's uh, performing um, in line with its mandate, uh, where you can really get traction and I think create a bit more liquidity and a, you know, essentially the right type of buy and hold buyer. So professional buyers are you know, smaller institutional managers who are actively seeking yield, yield equities, and have the mandate to, to hold those in a portfolio of discretion. Um, we found to be a very effective tool. That could be a UIT. That could be, uh, you know, an RIA who manages a proprietary portfolio. Um, not, not to be understated, I think, as far as creating good secondary market support. Yeah, and the one thing I would add is that I think the other thing that's important, and, and, and Bob and Michael and Steve pointed this out, is, is just the visibility of the manager in educating um, the investors and financial advisors on what's happening in the underlying asset class, right? So when something's happening in the asset class, the worst thing is nobody addresses it and you don't know what's going on and the fund then trades at a discount. So the, the managers that are proactive get on calls, educate you so you can understand, you know, why is healthcare selling off? Why do we think it's a good opportunity to be getting in right now? Um, I think that's really important in helping the secondary market and, you know, the good managers and something from an underwriter's perspective, we like to we insist that we see the good managers like Naveen, Calamos, Forward, they're, they're doing this proactively. So you can make the decision after that whether or not it's, it's an undue sell-off in that particular fund. And sometimes in the funds, you know, it goes too far one way, right? There's a, the, the health care is out of favor, and all of a sudden the, the closed-end fund goes from a premium to a discount, and the underlying assets go down. And, but, you know, if you can understand what the manager's thinking, why, why did we have the sell-off and what's the opportunity? And again, given it's a captive pool of assets, they can move it around to hopefully enhance the return when the market comes back. I think that's really important um, when you're looking to pick a, uh, a fund to, in to, to understand how these, they support in the secondary market. Allison, just one final point on this because I think, um, you know, we're, we're all kind of guilty slash responsible. I think as an industry, too, in this particular sector, we've really underinvested in research. Um, you know, there was a time 15 or 20 years ago where we had much wider research coverage on an individual name and a sector basis um, and fairly definitive buy, hold, sell ratings uh, and I would say true subject matter expertise in that domain. And I think that, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, you know, that has become perhaps more of a generalist kind of research model. Um, but I think, you know, investing in research, and obviously it, it is, an, you know, it is a, a costly um, service to provide, but great research on an individual stock level basis does a tremendous amount for um, a broker dealer community, you know, or a financial advisor population within a firm to better understand a strategy and is it working or not. And, you know, um, um, just the way regular way equities have very strong followings with underlying analysts. So I think as an industry, you know, if there's one other thing we could do is think about how to better invest in research around the product to create better visibility and, 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 uh, and, and, and you know, understanding of the product. I think that's a great point. I think one of the things we keep hearing on the secondary, but probably is just as important in the primary, is education. So we talked a little bit about what's the next asset class that we're going to see in the IPO market, and we talked about some complexity, some, some uh, perhaps more illiquid asset classes. When it comes to selling those types of products from the underwriter point of view, how do you think about the complexity of the product when it comes to educating within a short period of time during the IPO? Um, obviously, during the secondary, there's more time to get into, into that, those details, but in order to sell, folks have to be properly educated. Maybe I'll start and Michael can jump in here. I, look, that, that goes to the, the importance of having a strong distribution team, right, that can get out there in a, in a closed-down fund IPO. We have a one-month period to educate all the financial advisors so they're well-educated to communicate exactly what the fund is intended to do to the, to the client. So it's really important to have a strong distribution team in place to get that message across and to make sure that uh, everyone understands. So I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. yeah. I, no, go ahead. Yes. I would just say from Nuveen's perspective, we want to educate our own sales force to be you know, knowledgeable about the closed-end fund that we're marketing in a particular month but also the portfolio team and the strategy because we have other products and other wrappers that can essentially defend the closed end fund after the IPO period. So, you know, if obviously I'm biased and I want my, 
the closed end fund to be as big as possible, but if it means growth in a mutual fund strategy or another type of uh, product for the, and it's a good experience for the investor, that's all gravy from my perspective. And that's why the, the, the education with the sales force is, is critical and goes back to Bob, your comment, you know, because the closed ends are thinly traded, you want as much education out there as, as possible. Yeah, I think there's an art form that's probably lost in this too, that insofar as um, if we really believe what we're saying, which is this is a superior delivery vehicle or vehicle to deliver complex, illiquid, less understood, off-market, lower correlated assets, um, that's great. And we have a responsibility to deliver those products. Um, this is where I think active distribution probably doesn't get enough credit. Um, you know, we as distributors have to be able to do, and I worked at BlackRock for many years running this business, and my boss, Rob Capito, would always say, look, can you explain this product in 30 seconds to your grandmother? Literally, that was essentially the, the you know, the, 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 um, the, the um, median that, that you have to engineer the delivery of a complex strategy to. And, and to your point, Gaston, active distribution is enormously critical um, in, uh, in doing that, just as it is, you know, to, in supporting uh, that in the aftermarket. Just one other point just on education is that I think one of the areas that closed end funds gets a bad rap is that people, and this is an education for clients by, by, every, by all of you and, and all of us, but people look just at where the current price is and they forget the distributions that they've received on a closed end fund. And if you think about it, just thinking about the equity strategy that I highlighted before, right? We're delivering a total return to you through some in current income and some in price appreciation. So if you just look at the price appreciation in the underlying NAV or the market price, you're missing out on part of the distribution that you received that was part of your total return. And I know it's hard in some cases on various statements, it's hard to see what that total income or that distribution that you receive, but it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to point that the client back to that and say, look, it's not, you know, trading at $10 and that's all you, the, the return that you received, you received $3 worth of, of dividends over the course of the last year. So it's really important to look at both components of your return when you're looking at the return on a closed end fund. That's a great point. And at this point, uh, we have a few minutes left. We'll open it up to questions and answers from the audience. Uh, from the point of view of um, an investor, and let's say the um, RIA world, which is my world. Um, first of all, Steve, that was a breath of fresh air. Uh, innovation is probably one of the solutions for keeping this industry from becoming an anachronism. Uh, from where I sit, there are problems with the closed-end fund space that when you have a managed distribution, the managed distribution itself, is not earned enough to where the net asset value is higher after the managed distribution and the management itself of the fund and the portfolio works with a smaller base. And yes, you have the leverage, but leverage works two ways. So from the point of view of what I see in some of the best sponsored funds, which I own, BlackRock being among them, we have seen the problem continually an erosion or even a decumulation, as you're talking about, as the drawdowns from the expected return that you're going to give to your investors meet some type of a hurdle rate. Mm. The fund managers, for the most part, don't meet the hurdle rate. So the funds themselves are not performing. So if you start with whether the funds we're going to do something about this, particularly in the equity space, it would seem to me we have to look to better performance before we do anything. Secondly, when I, when I uh, look at what it is that I think we're trying to do, You'll have research, plenty of it, if you care to take a look at the sponsor level. If the sponsors themselves took a look at whether or not there was a historic discount, and any time that that, let's say it's a 6% hurdle rate, and let's say I have a 9% uh, discount, historically, they say they're going to buy back the shares at some future time. If those shares sell at a 12 or 13% discount, and they have a 6% uh, distribution rate, they would be far better off buying their own shares. And there's where the rub is. 
the sponsors and the trustees do not necessarily want to, want to buy them back. If they triggered an interest on the part of the investing public that says any time it trades at a significantly discount below our historic discounts, we'd be a buyer. You would close the discount gap. But it's not happening at the sponsor level, not, not happening at the trustee level. Would you care to comment? I mean, I think that there's probably a variety of opinions on the long-term effectiveness of buybacks, if that's the, you know, I'll answer your second question first. Um, I mean, I think you could make the argument that you're treating the symptom and not the root cause. Um, if you have a fund that's trading, you know, perpetually at a deep discount, either, you know, there are probably a number of factors that contribute to that. The overall fund performance, its performance relative to the peer group, its size and liquidity and distribute kind of its its dispersion, what the what the shareholder base looks like. So not 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 to say that there isn't, you know, potential value in in um, in buying back shares, but I think it's a probably less binary and probably more complex thing to look at. And I, I think that uh, certainly my colleagues on the panel have um, been very conscientious of that, whether it's on the front end looking at a particular fund in an asset class, how that asset class has performed, and uh, if and when um, offering, a, you know, an additional product in that space makes sense. I think in terms of what a distribution rate is, there's many things that go into that, and, and not the least of which, of course, is where is that fund competing relative to its peer group, what's its yield? Is that going to be competitive? What do you think the long-term rate is? And the, the benefit of the managed distribution is, okay, you may not make it in April, but you will double more than make it in May, and so on and so forth. So what you try to do is, you know, you, you don't get the stock is not benefited by having an erratic distribution based on what the, the fund happens to make in that point in time. And, and we've, we've done a number of studies that in the day. So the level distribution, the managed distribution, is really better for the shareholder. Again, it's incumbent upon the asset management firm to ensure that that level, given what they, where they are today and where they think the market's going to be and their portfolio is going to be down the road, earns it. If not, they should cut it. Because in the end, again, you can't, you can't charge your customers for services that you're not providing. The point I would make, I, Thanks, I, think Bob. I think unfortunately, if you don't mind, I think we've run out of time and we're already a little behind. So I want to thank all of our panelists and thank the audience for your time today.